Well, we're straight into it now with our first uh, interview, and it's with Luke Elworthy, the author of a brand new book. It's called The Last Letter of Godfrey Cheatham. It's a very interesting book, this. It's not quite what you'd expect, and Luke is on the line right now to chat with us. Uh, hey there, Luke. How's things? Hi, Leanne. I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Oh, very good to have you uh, on, on the show today. And like I say, this, this is... Um, this is interesting because here you have, you pick up the book and there's this, there's this chap looking at you and uh, he looks done in, you know, and like he's had a tough, <laughs> tough time. And, 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 the, and the words at the top of the book are a novel of father figures, bullshit and belonging, which I think is, uh, is intriguing. I mean, who wouldn't want to pick up this book and start reading it? Well, that's very kind. I, I hope everyone feels the same way. It, yeah, he's, he does look a bit done in. He's kind of unraveled. He uh, he unravels unravels some more and and actually he dies and all of that's on the on the cover of the book so no spoilers there but he before all that happens he yeah he has this pretty spectacularly successful uh, career in international p- book publishing but um yeah things things go off the rails at a uh, family reunion um, that happens in you know in a place kind of not unfamiliar to me or based on it was sort of based on a family reunion that I myself attended and um, yeah but Godfrey is not me I should make it quite clear at this point There's well been quite a lot of speculation yes know? I heard I heard in another interview that you said perhaps there is a little bit of me in Godfrey there is a little bit and um, uh, he, well he was sort of much more successful than me I yeah, part of this came about, I was trying, I said about writing a memoir about 15 years ago and I was trying, thinking about all of these successful um, uh, autobiographies of business people whose kind of careers had hit a bit of a speed bump and then they sort of triumphed over adversity and came out the other end. Everything was great and I thought it would be fun to write a, a sort of comic a story about a career that was a disaster from start to finish. Um, sort of loosely based on mine, but the problem was mine, mine was certainly disappointing, but um, I was finding I had to, you know, really manufacture the disaster, so that's kind of, <laughs> yeah. that started the, the journey into, uh, into fiction. Okay, so, so this, is, this, is, this is kind of a sad story, Luke. So you're saying you, you have disappointments, you have regrets, in what, in what way? Well... Yeah, no, don't we all? I mean, my career never quite lived. You know, I I seriously thought I was going to be Godfrey Cheatham for a while. I thought I was going to be running a big international publishing house and, um, you know, making mega deals. And, uh, you know, no, people didn't always feel the same way about my brilliance as I did, you see. So uh, never quite happened. But, um, yeah, I kind of, yeah, I worked in publishing for 20 plus years and um, worked in some places that will, yeah, that kind of, adapt and, and you know they may look familiar to people who also worked at those places and and who do read the book and sort of think oh yeah that sounds a bit like uh, I shouldn't even mention the, the employers but um yeah I'm sorry I'm probably going completely off track now Leanne. No where, please where do we? you can fully go <laughs> off track on the show that's what we're all about <laughs> plenty of time to um to to uh, divert into different subjects oh we were just discussing Good. I get what you mean you know of course everyone has regrets and everyone sets out with a dream don't they and perhaps you get to an age and you go okay well I didn't quite expect that this was where I would end up and this is different to it's like that whole what's that John yeah. Lennon saying life's what what happens to you when you're busy making other plans yeah no that's a great quote isn't it and yeah it's sort of I hoped and and exploring this guy's life you know I hoped I could get all of that shambles and stuff and 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 eventual failure that we've discussed but also that the reader would get a sense of the you know, sadness and uh, even perhaps at times despair that um, some of the best comedy, you know, falls out of. So Godfrey is sort of, uh, I guess he, he's wistful and looking back on this life that has, un, you know, unraveled. He's in prison. He's trying to explain to his sister the events that led to his imprisonment. You know, some of that, some of that story she knows about, but some critical details she doesn't. But he's also given up on this... Um, great New Zealand novel that he's been writing for most of his life and um, uh, yeah so he's that's a big regret for him and uh, I don't know 
perhaps I do. Perhaps I do regret that I never wrote, uh, a gr- you know, the great New Zealand novel, and I'm pretty sure this is not going to be it. But uh, <laughs> why, you know, why do you say that? <laughs> well, I mean, it doesn't want to be. You know, it wants to be a funny exploration of um, of a particular life, and it, yeah, I wanted to say some stuff about the New Zealand, uh, or particularly the kind of New Zealand that I saw coming back from quite a long time, living overseas in the early 2000s. And um, actually, I came to live in, in Arrowtown. And, um, yeah, just there were some interesting things going on around here and some interesting things going on nationally. And, um, mm. yeah, sort of, yeah, I wanted to write about a character who had a response sort of not unlike mine to some of those things, I suppose. Mm. That contrast from coming from, you know, big cities of the world back to Arrowtown, how did you find that? Well, it was a, it was really exciting. I mean, we had most recently been living in in Sydney for the six years before that, and then before that, I'd spent a long time in the UK and in the Netherlands and in Belgium. But um, yeah, coming here, well, it was amazing. It was pretty intoxicating. You know, you know what it's like. I mean, you, it's there's all that the pace, and we've just driven through. My partner's just. Um, flown back to Blenheim where we live mm. um, today. I've just dropped her off the airport and we've got a, a friend, um, a writer friend from um, a UK guy who lives in France and he's just been, his mouth, <laughs> he's been completely gobsmacked about um, the natural beauty, the the kind of exciting, uh, well, just the restaurants, the pace, the yeah. life. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's mm. just, um, yeah, it's, interesting to see it through his eyes and then, you know, like mm. four planes came and landed while we were there. And yeah, it's 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 probably too fast for me now. I don't, you know, I'm, we're pretty happy living where where we live, but um, it's so exciting to be to be back here. And yeah, I was certainly excited to be here when I arrived in, um, yeah, well, I think around 2005. Mm. Ar- Aratown and Queenstown hums in winter, doesn't it? It comes alive when the rest of the country sort of goes to sleep, I think. Yeah, yeah, it, um, it's, it's, yeah, I couldn't believe it. We were, after the launch last night, we went out to um, places I'm sure you'll know, and well, we went to the Blue Door and then across oh, to Oh, not the Blue Door. Restaurant. <laughs> oh. The Blue Door. We, <laughs> yeah. we managed to extract ourselves, but um, not everybody there. Not did, everybody but, does, but, actually. Once you enter that door, it's uh, on a Wednesday night. I've been there. I know what you mean. Yeah, well, it was Wednesday particularly good there? I wonder. Yes. If, uh, was it particularly busy? Uh, yes, but, Wednesday. It was completely packed. Was it? Yes, Wednesday is normally yeah. band night there. I don't know. Did they have live there, music last night? There was a there was there was a band. Yeah, it was absolutely amazing. Um, unfortunately, the the French based friend fell asleep, missed the book launch, missed the uh, <laughs> missed the band, and missed the blue door. So I've just been telling him what a bloody idiot he was and <laughs> missed the highlight of our little tour. What a shame. Anyway. It, it, but it is. No, Wednesday night is a special night in Arrowtown in winter and uh, some people start at the tap, the Falcon and Tap, and they go to the Celtic, there's a little Celtic Irish band, folk band there, and, and then they walk on down to the Blue Door and then they'll go and have a meal and then back to the, you know, it's it's all self-contained. Yeah, and yeah. Quite easy, really. And how was, the, how was it at Dorothy Brown's last night, the bookstore and, and cinema? Did that go well? Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, we had so we filled the, the big cinema and had people sitting in the in the aisle. And um, I gave a gave them a little, you know, shambolic uh, talk. But it it was actually it was slightly strange starting off because the rest of these I've done one in Auckland and one in Havelock North and one in Christchurch and going to be back in Blenheim next week. Um, oh, in Wellington as well. And they've all been, you know, sort of people milling around and having a drink, eating something, and then I say them a little bit, and then I've had someone sort of talk about the book. But because this was a, you know, in a cinema, they were, people were all sitting. We sort of mingled a bit first, and then they were sitting down and kind of looking at me, it was like delivering some kind of quite formal lecture. So, um, but it went really well. It, uh, yeah, and I read a bit from the book and read bits that. Um, actually, it was the first time on this thing. There's a couple of opening pages are really quite solemn and serious and pompous old Godfrey who kind of throws in unnecessarily big words into things when he shouldn't really um, but it sounds quite somber and last night was the first night I'd actually read one of the bits that well, I, I find funny and a few other people found funny 
and it went really well. People were laughing, and uh, yeah, I was yeah, I was thrilled. And we sold mm. more than one copy per head. That's astonishing. Which hasn't happened before. I know. Normally, booksellers say they work off you know one copy for every four people, and uh, we had what did we have? We just had the capacity there is sort of fifty max, and we had it fifty plus and sold nearly sixty books. That's so, so um, good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just thrilled and it was great that Philippa and Clem and the team at um, at Dorothy's were, you know, so supportive. It was really, you know, it was terrific. It's a, it's a wonderful venue, that. And, uh, you know, when I go to choose a book, that's one of the places I go to in Queenstown, either there or Bound Bookstore in Queenstown, because uh, she really, yeah. they really have good taste in, in literature and they have some great books there for sale. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's sort of, um, it's always been tough, you know, to sell books in Queenstown, I don't know, God, in the late 80s, and um, it was quite a tough market, really, and they, they had, there, was, there was one in a pharmacy, there was a bookshop in a pharmacy in downtown Queenstown when I started off, but it was the only, and is it Paper Plus? I'm not sure, I'm presuming it's a wet course, but... Yeah. Yeah, it was not, yeah, it hasn't always had a good independent bookshop, so it's great that Dorothy's have got you know their range and it's you know they haven't got heaps of space so it's mm. it's carefully curated but um it's mm. such a cool environment and yeah oh, and i haven't good. been to bound i must go and have a look bound is amazing and it's also it right. sells vinyl and i admire them so much you know they they yeah, yeah. they have they, they have everything everything i've got there has been uh, incredible like first class so i recommend and i think we're so oh, lucky brilliant. that we've got an indie book stall there and, yeah. and and we've got you know so we've got Queenstown which is amazing, and they do well. Yeah. They've they have proven all the naysayers wrong. People still want yeah. books. I think you know. Yeah. No. It's. I mean, the first um, book trade conference I attended as a young sales rep in about nineteen. When I'm going to say about eighty eight or something like that, and we went to one of the talks. So Jeffrey Archer was there promoting his latest blockbuster before you know before he ended up in in jail. Yes. He went to jail, <laughs> yeah. and and then there was we had a presentation on on the future on on e-books, and basically it was everybody came out and said uh, we we're screwed, you know, print books are dead, and I'm not kidding. This was in '88, and look at us now. I mean, e-books, you know, there's an e market for e-books, but printers uh, were not bigger than ever, but it's just still massive. So. Um, yeah, and that certainly wasn't being forecast then. So yeah, it's weird how things. What's that French thing? You know, blue star change, and you know, more things change the more they yeah. stay the same. Yes, yeah, interesting. Hey, I was just thinking, wouldn't it be great? Do you have a copy in front of you? Could you read something for us? Uh, that that chapter yeah, that you sure. read? It'd be terrific. Sure. Do you want me to? Um, so I start the solemn series or more the silly. Or both. Well, do both. How long have you got? Just to give people, yeah. we've we've got we can do this whole hour, so we we've, we've got time. So I, I think just to give listeners an idea, the best way is to hear from the book itself and, and the author. So yeah, go, go for your life. Cool. All right. I'll start. So as I said, can you hear me? I've just got you on the speaker. Yes, that's fine. Um, yeah. So Godfrey's writing to his sister uh, Rosemary and. Um, He's, yeah, he's explaining, he's writing from his prison cell and he's explaining to her kind of how he got there and he's looking back at his, at his life and some of the events that sort of led to him being locked up. He calls her Ropu, a nickname that he, he'll explain. Ropu, okay. Uh, right. Dear Ropu, the squeal of a rubber soul tells me it's dusk. I can't see the sky, but I hear the guards choose as they stalk the vinyl corridors. The evening lock-up. You don't know it, thank God, but each of us sees our own sliver of nightfall's gloom. Just believe me when I tell you, as every prisoner will, that it's the bleakest hour, the time when the mad, bad, sad are confined to their cells, to weep and to roar. The authentic key-rattling experience of incarceration is sometimes so ludicrously close to its corniest depiction in film or literature that one would laugh, Ro, if only one didn't want so much to join in the din and howl. Tonight, just as I do nearly every evening around this time, I think of you, of mother, I hold her memory tight, and of my son. Please give Martin a big hug when you all gather for his birthday. You're his truest aunt. It means a lot to me that you'll be there. 
I also think, of course, of fathers. But this evening is different. It's almost as if there's a new cast on the world. That's because I write with news of a personal revelation, one that's been rather a long time coming. On this occasion, once again, I was the very last to know. It's unlikely my problematic novel will find a publisher. Problematic. How's that for the elegant understatement Father always tried to teach us that I could never quite master? Celebrated London editor and media savant that I was, so the story went. One might have expected I'd have realised a little earlier that 1,600 pages presented a length that was commercially challenging, but such is the hubris of the supposed cultural mercenary. This is getting into some... Uh, this is when... This is pompous, Godfrey. Yep. The willful blindness of the voyant impresario. Savant, voyant, doyen, impresario. Why are all the best words that best describe that mastering one's artistic universe only sold in French and Italian. The truth was, I neither truly knew nor clearly saw, but I see now, sometimes it's as if I see too much. So that's the, the opening couple of pages. Yeah, that? brilliant. I love well, the word doyen. It's, uh, it's a word that I haven't heard for many years. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, golf is always he's sort of, you know, pretty full of bullshit. And... Um, and he's always, you know, uh, doesn't miss an opportunity to, uh, yeah, to throw in sort of unnecessary big words. But I, yeah, hopefully that's <laughs> yeah. not off putting. No, I'll, I'll, I'll look for that. I, I think that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I, I, I almost thought of introducing a word of the week uh, segment because I think, I think language is something that is still interesting. But carry on, carry on. Yeah, I've got, I, when you start your word of the week segment, I've got one... Um, I've got one for you. Someone read this, an editor, and said, what did he say? He's, it was sort of supposed to be common, but he said that I made a good fist of um, this Godfrey's voice, which he described as orotund, O-R-O-T-U-N-D, which I had to look up. Yeah, I would have and to I'm look that up. Orotund. It's sort of, sort of round, yeah, sort of full and round and sort of... Yeah, I don't know actually, but, but yeah, it just sounds it sounds good. And, uh, it's the sort of word that Godfrey would probably like to use himself. Wish I wish I heard it before, and I would have put it in in the book. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, and Shall I read a silly bit? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Am I talking too much? I am. No. Anyway. This is what I like. I don't want to put okay. you on the radio and you don't say anything because uh, okay, yeah, good. that would make I'll, my I'll job look. harder. Yeah. I'll I'll put you on speaker. Again. Um. So Godfrey, so his, the other thing I didn't say before is that um, um, I was talking about those business memoirs that I kind of had in mind, I was, I was trying to subvert in a way when um, I set off writing this memoir. But another thing kind of going on in publishing in the end of the 90s was the, um, the, that Frank McCourt had had, you know, Angela's Ashes, and, and there were a lot of books about... Uh, well, sort of a whole subgenre of books about characters and families or, or real families where, you know, mm. lives were really tough. And, uh, you know, they they started to be called the, the they were coined the, the misery memoir. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, without, you know, wanting to poke fun at, at all at, at seriously tough lives and, and, and lives of poverty and, you know, and despair and violence... I thought it would be fun to write about a character who grew up and whose misery was about growing up in a creative family and constantly, you know, failing to meet the expectations of that creative family, particularly mm. his parents. Right. So Godfrey is the kind of one creative child who's, who's, who's you know, um, efforts never really quite pay off. So his mother is... They have these family meetings and his mother particularly... They sort of assign a different, you know, one's going to be the painter and one's going to be the musician and, and um, uh, one's going to be the visual artist and whatever. Yeah. But Godfrey's kind of, Godfrey's flailing about trying to um, figure out what his role is going to be. <laughs> right. And he, he decides to be, a, to look at, to experiment with pottery. So, um, yeah, they're just following one of their meetings. So, um, here we go. So, but the meeting survived and even prospered. And within the framework they provided, we learned we could take any nascent artistic hopes and develop them. At least that was the idea. My nascent artistic hope was pottery. 
I really fucking hated pottery. I'd really been as unhappy as when sitting at that wheel, kneading and teasing the clay to please our mother. She was determined that some of the most celebrated artists in all of 1970s New Zealand were sculptural potters. There was Joe Bloom, Ham San Santorini, and the guy who lived in the Coromandel, who had a little train in which he'd chug his pots from his wheel into the kiln a few hundred metres from his studio. The potters were bigger than poets like James K. Baxter, mother said, and more influential than novelists like Morris Shadbolt or filmmakers like Barry Barclay, and they sold their work overseas out into the famous wider cultural universe, which we New Zealanders instinctively knew was an important thing to do. But how I hated pottery. It was all a bit distressing. Father couldn't even bring himself to use the word. If he had to mention my work with clay, he would talk about earthenware or engaging with malleable media. It was true that it sounded a lot more important than being a humble potter, so it could be argued that father's nomenclature, albeit gravely highfalutin, almost gave the world of pots some real credibility, even indicating his grudging approval of the milieu, as he would never call it. For father, it was the wrong French term. To him, pottery was artisan art, craft, like building model aeroplanes. In truth, father was always vehemently anti-clay. I think he just understood that if he talked like this about pottery, he turned it from being the delicate art form mother loved into being a technique or a science, or even a business, things she said she really despised. His pieces are extraordinarily sculptural, Mother said. Oh, my work was sculptural, all right. If you couldn't tug and twist your lump of mud into something with some utilitarian value, maybe an incense stick holder or a dog bowl, as I demonstrably could not, you poked your thumb into it as it spun around on the gruesome turntable of terracotta torture, its whirring grooves filled with dun-coloured silted water, tugged on the glutinous rim a little, and suddenly, squelch, you had a piece of sculpture. You had very, very possibly created art that would taught and confront or move people to feel awkward and best unfelt thoughts, and maybe even sell for a decent price internationally. When I bought my first piece home, it had started out as a night at the round table, turned into a microbus, and ended up as lumpy cumulonimbus and storm warning too, a work in clay with mixed, ra mixed media, Raku pit fired, mother wept. Actually, that wasn't funny at all, but it's anyway, it's more of the kind of lighter, <laughs> the lighter stuff. Well, I, lo yeah, I love how you've included the pottery uh, theme going through. Because I, I sort of, my mother used to do pottery and it was, it was a real, um, it was a real thing for a while in this country, wasn't it? Yeah, when I, someone, I had a chat with someone before a, a, an interview and they were talking about pottery and of course it seems to have come back, even some of that 70s stuff has come back pretty big and um, I was thinking, I, I think she probably thought I was sort of taking the piss out of pottery and I should have been kinder about it but it's really hard to do, I certainly found it, I found it extremely difficult to put a pot on it, I mean it's so satisfying to watch someone uh, you know, turn of thing, but it's. Have you ever done any pottery? It's tricky. Uh, I think yeah, I had a, had a wee go. It is. It's harder than it looks. It, mm. it, I did love the um, the feel of it though, and yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a very tactile, uh, interesting, therapeutic thing to do. Yeah, exactly. And it, um, I mean, and even when you like, if you get your fingers in the wrong place, and I really haven't done much, but if you when it starts to go wrong, even that's satisfying. And those. You know, those goes <laughs> and the whole sort of t yeah. top lip sort of falls over, and uh, yeah. Anyway, it's, I find it like baking. Uh, I I I like to do emotional baking at times, and it sort of felt like a similar thing. But I haven't done enough of it to to really comment. No. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly am no baker, so uh, you've done a lot of that. Done a lot of lockdown COVID baking. Yes, that sort of stuff. That's what yeah. happened. Yeah. yeah. And it also accounted for a bit of weight gain when I started making scones and <laughs> things again. You know, it was like, yeah. But it's like you realise that you're not 20 and you can't eat that stuff anymore, you know. But, um, yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've got, I've got to go backwards a bit uh, to, because, I mean, I know that uh, you spent time at Centrepoint. After, yeah. after your schooling. What are, what are the memories you have of that? And are you okay to talk about that? Yeah, you know, I'm fine to talk about it. I sort of, I, um, I actually, so my mother moved there when I was in, I think, the fourth in year 10, year 11. So what was that 70, 78 probably. And um, I, by that stage, I was already at boarding school in Christchurch and in a pretty different sort of world, although... Strangely, the two worlds are more 
similar in some ways than you might imagine. But so I came home to Auckland for the holidays and spent half of each holiday with my father and stepmother on the North Shore, and then the other half with my mother and sisters at Centre Point. And um, so the girls were there with mum full time. So I was, you know, just a, I guess, a holiday visitor. But I, mm. yeah, I got sort of fully, when you say fully involved in Centre Point, that sounds, but I, you know, I remember thinking, you know, this is where the place I'll be forever. I, wow. And certainly when I came, when I was still going there in my last year at school, I can remember seriously thinking that, you know, in the next year, whatever that was, about 1981, that I would, um, uh, you know, move and live in Centre Point full time. And that, yeah, it was kind of scary. I mean, well, it's a cult and, um, mm. and uh, there was real kind of coercion. And my mother's role there was pretty challenging. I don't know her role, but her she kind of bucked against the Bert Potter and 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 the system a bit. But certainly more like she was well known to be the kind of most troublesome tr- troublesome resident in terms of the the Bert she, and the kind of little coterie of people that ran it. So she questioned things. There. Yeah, yeah. She got up and and I can remember sitting there and thinking in meetings, saying, "Mom, shut the fuck." You know, it's like because you could tell. And there was probably a little hint of this, I guess, in one of the meetings that, in a place that kind of, I guess, was certainly grew out of Centre Point in the book. But um, you kind of, because you're sort of scared for anything, and this is not, you know, it's it's not smart um, questioning These questioning people. authority. And, and mm. yeah, Centre Point authority was like any other sort of authority in a way. You know, you, you know people who did best there, Sort of towed the towed the, line. Towed the party line. Mm. Yeah, oh, pretty scary. But for the girls, it was a yeah. I, I, I'm certainly not qualified to talk about some of their, their experiences there. But they've, they've done, particularly the older of my two sisters has spoken about it. She's took part in a documentary that um, I can't even remember it was TV and Z. I think um, the three three former. You know, people who were there as young people mm. talking. Um, it was probably about eighteen months ago. I remember and, seeing uh, that. It was good. Yeah. Mm. So she did an amazing job and um, was super brave. And but I, I've sort of always felt, you know, it's sort of a bit troubled by the fact. Well, I I went off to boarding school and all of that was, you know, I mean, I was asked if I wanted to go, and I think the idea was that I w- would have found it less disruptive. Sorry more disruptive, you know, moving around. Mum was sort of not, you know, she was having a, this was sort of still pre-seeing the point, so she was, yeah, but was, suffered from bipolar issues and, yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway, it was a tough sort of time and a lot of people that ended up in Centre Point had had some pretty challenging times in their in their lives. And anyway, so it was, the girls were thought more able to sort of cope with, being there, which is kind of weird, and you look back at it. So here was I at this, you know, living this life of real privilege at, at a sort of, you know, Church of England boarding school, and here were they at Centre Point. So it's, um, mm. yeah, it was a bit a bit weird. Mm. Do, um, is it weird something? Is it something that you've, um, you know, that 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 impacts you on a daily basis, or is it just a period of your life that you've compartmentalised and you've just gone, well, that was that. Um, definitely the the latter, really. It's, yeah, I kind of feel that people had some really damaging experiences there and mine wasn't that, you know. Uh, I can look back on it, and, you know, in a way, it's it certainly hasn't made my life less rich. You know, I'm just really interesting things that I remember about that time. But I think a lot of us weren't that aware of... Um, I certainly, yeah, an awful lot of the stuff that we now know about Centre Point wasn't apparent to every, you know, there was stuff going on that clearly lots of people did know about who lived there at the time, but equally lots of people had no idea. Yeah, I was gobsmacked when I heard, or certainly when those first abuse charges, or or before that even the first, you know, drugs charges came out of it, I I Mm. could not believe it. I mm. yeah, I had no no inkling, and, and I'm pretty sure my mother didn't either. And you know, she'd been there. I can't even think how long she was there. Probably eight years or more. Mm. Incredible, quite a long time. Yeah, isn't it? 
Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's good to hear that it is the latter. And, of course, I mean, let's track right back. So, I, I mean, I think it's fascinating that you were born in India. Do you have many memories of, of, time, of your time there? No, not much. Sometimes I think I do. Like, I was only, I wasn't even barely two when we left. So, I sometimes think that I can, um, that I can remember that time. But yeah, my father was a diplomat and um, he'd been working in, in London and met my mother. And, oh, he went to university in London. Oh, sorry, university in, he went to Cambridge and then, and then ended up getting a job in foreign affairs. I mean, he wouldn't, as it was then called, he wouldn't have, I don't think his degree would have been good enough to, I think the combination of having an English degree and foreign affairs being kind of pretty snooty then at the time, mm. uh, he wouldn't have got a, he, well, he's the first to admit he probably wouldn't have got a job there today. Um, but, yeah, he ended up kind of falling into it a bit and then coming back to New Zealand and then his first overseas posting was, was New Delhi when we, yeah, so we had a New Zealand had an embassy there and I think then it closed and then Ed and Hillary opened one up again. I think that's how it worked under the Labour government in the 80s. I may have those dates wrong, but yeah, so Dad was there on a posting and my sister and I were both born there. Um, and, but I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, some, yeah, as I say, sometimes I think I remember some of it, but um, apparently what I, this, my father swears this is true, but... Mm. Because if you're, you know, you're living there as an expat, and particularly the Matt's family, you know, you're there, you get as a gardener and a cleaner and an above the, I think if you've been above the eye line cleaner and a, some weird thing like that, someone cleaned up, <laughs> I don't know how that worked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, and then um, apparently there were seven, and there was a, like a, there's a, a stipulated amount of, Domestic staff, you're supposed to have at certain levels, but probably if you're the ambassador, you probably have, I don't know, 27 or something. But then you know, there's seven different staff for this young diplomat and his family. It was kind of nuts. Mm. But, um, and then apparently I came back to my grandparents' house in, um, in Wellington, and we, I could speak as good as any child could ever speak English, I suppose, at the time. I could speak um, Hindi. Right. And I said, looked out the window. I've re- seriously questioned the story because it sounds to me a bit um, unlikely, but pa- my father swears it's true. And apparently I said in Hindi, um, look at that old, there's an old man uh, in the garden. Look at the old man gardener or something like that. Um, and I was looking outside and looking at my grandfather, wow. who I must have known. Wasn't, well, perhaps I hadn't even, I don't know, perhaps I hadn't even hauled in with my grandfather at that point. Mm-hmm. But um and I said that in, in Hindi, and the word for gardener in Hindi is Mali, M-A-L-I, and so he got called Mali for Mali. the rest of his life. But it's, you know, one of those sort of family Glories. folklore things that yes. people hang on to. Yeah, yeah, isn't that amazing? Gosh. Well. Yeah. And, and so your father, your father, David, did he have quite a bit of input into this book? He, well, that's a tricky question because he, only recently he... I've pinched a poem of his. Um, he wrote a poem when he was still at school. He wrote a whole lot of poems. and He was published in the Penguin Anthology of... I think it's the Penguin Anthology, one of an important anthology of New Zealand verse in the... Mm. I'm going to say the 60s. Right, yes. And, and he wrote quite a lot of poetry about his parents and their farm in South Canterbury. Um, and I don't... I, he was published in The Listener too, I think, and he... Uh, it, his parents were quite upset because he was thought to be kind of gently mocking their lives of, you know, some privilege in South Canterbury. And he, so one of the poems uh, in particular is called Afternoon Tea and I use the poem in the in the book and it's sort of a running, part of the kind of running plot really because the, the father character who has a few similarities to my own father, probably. Mm-hmm. But as I said, there's some, some of me and Godfrey and some of, uh, of uh, Herbert and, uh, and my father, or my father and this Herbert character. So he's writing this poem throughout his life and he delivers the final kind of verse at the, um, at the family reunion that kind of is the whole sort of centrepiece of the, of the end of the novel. Mm. Um, anyway, so I pinched that. I did it and so obviously asked for his permission. And he's read it. Yeah, he's read the book a number mm. of times since, and he got up and spoke about it at the event we did in um, 
in Christchurch on Monday, which was very kind of him. Mm, that's fantastic. So, yeah, How nice to have that yeah. input and, and you know, and to sort sh- of share this this moment. Yeah, I think so. And it's that kind of book. It's sort of well, it is a book about family, really. I think, and yeah. So it was mm. important to me to. He probably would have preferred I wrote my own poem or pinch somebody else's, but <laughs> for me it was kind of like a way of yeah giving some sort of tribute to Dad. I think it's fantastic. And and so it was a personal question, but he he. Wouldn't be so young anymore. He's not. He's eighty-six. Right. Oh, he's yeah. Eighty-six. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I've got an eighty-seven-year-old mum. He's and is he in good health? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's pretty good. Yeah, he um, he gets. I don't think he'd mind me saying that he gets a sort of atrial fibrillation occasionally. He gets like a racing. His heart starts to beat yes. in an uneven way and. Sometimes brought on by stress, mm. or uh, used to be a combination of red wine and whiskey. But um, <laughs> he's not having, not combining them anymore, and he still gets the odd atrial fibrillation. But he got one after this. Um, he delivered his little thing for me. It was a very moving thing for me on Monday night, and then I didn't tell me this until after the event. Got a went down with this atrial fibrillation so uh, which is I don't know anything about it, but it's pretty uncomfortable you know, scary you just, yeah. freak out oh yeah. yeah oh yeah very much yeah how's your mum doing yeah well she um, I think she may be listening now so um, I, I want to say hello Di she's she's had yeah. struggles because she lost her eyesight last year which was really shocking to all of us because yeah. she was a very independent and uh, you know a person and living on, on her own and chopping firewood and you know doing everything until this catastrophic event you know last April so it was, oh, no. it was just awful because it just seemed particularly cruel um, when she was doing pretty well but she did have um, uh, poor eyesight in the other eye and it was just unfortunate it started with glaucoma and various other bits and pieces so Um, yeah I've sort of been on that journey but uh, gosh she's a trooper she's doing uh, she's doing really well and um, you know a lot of people say that's the worst sense that you would like to lose in your life Uh, but absolutely but and very very hard to change but you know we what we have we we have a shared interest in tennis and so if, if the tennis is on i'll do the commentary <laughs> so so we'll have yeah. the tv on and i'll say he's just uh you know he's just volleyed over the net and uh now it comes a comes a forehand cross court you know no it's hilarious and so no we oh, still that's fantastic no, we, we that's still wonderful. i know we have a, we have a few laughs and uh great sense of humor yeah. and uh and and you know this year's been hard for everyone with uh covid yeah. and poor mum yeah. got covid recently and yeah. as did i and it was it's been a, a yeah. shocker of a six weeks really and i haven't been able to see her as much as i'd like so that's been really hard for her and really hard for yeah for everyone, the re- she's in a care home because um, yeah. because of the sight issues. That's the only reason, really. Um, yeah. And it's like mobility problems. But they're terrific to her, and they're they're like uh, they're wonderful people there. And uh, I, it's really restored my faith in you know in that side of things. She's in Queenstown, which is great. So she's close to me. Oh, is she because she comes from the Bay of Plenty. Now, where where is yeah. your father based at the moment? He has just moved into. Uh, Give my best to your mother. It's, um, Thank yeah, you so um, much. She sounds sounds an amazing she's, woman. She's incredible, incredible. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, Dad has just moved. Dad and his wife, my stepmother, have just sold up in Blenheim, where they lived quite close to us, mm. and they've moved into a retirement place in just outside Christchurch, or well, sort of in in the suburbs of Christchurch. Right. Yes. So that's been kind of a big move. They've only been there for sort of three last three or four weeks. So. Yeah, sort of takes a bit of getting Big change. used to it, I'm sure, oh, yes. as mother found out. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would be. So yeah. you have both parents alive, which is great. Yes, I'm oh, sorry, no, 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 sorry, my mother died. Yeah, my stepmother's alive, but my mother oh, died I'm sorry. about, uh, no, it's all right. I should remember exactly the dates. It's going to be more than 10 years, about 2004, I'd say, 2000. Oh, okay. Oh, so no, we sorry, 2007, ago. something like that. Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. She died when she's only seventy. So yeah, that's young. Gosh, sort of young these days. Yeah, that is young. You know, they I do. think of I think of it as young, especially as they get older. <laughs> you might be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Age doesn't seem so. You know, nothing. Um, you know, when you're twenty and you know someone who's forty-five, you think they're just what, one foot in the grave, don't you? Really. Yeah, well, that's right. Hey, is your if you don't mind me asking, is your mother's not in the in the Arrowtown retirement village, is she? No, she's in the Fakatipu Care Home. Uh, mm, the one okay. in Frankton. I'm, mm. I'm Right, because I'm I'm going to have a little talk at the the Arrowtown one this afternoon, oh. at four o'clock. 
Oh, that's a pity because that would have been that would have been brilliant. Um, they do do lots of events where she is, and I think that's uh, I think that's a great thing. So you're going to the Arrowtown yeah. one. Oh, that'll be. Fa- so are you in Arrowtown yeah. for a few more days, Luke? Um, we're just no, we're heading away to, to here tonight and heading away tomorrow. Heading up, take up the probably drive up the west coast and then fantastic. And then we've got one of these events in Blenheim, and then and then we're all done and dusted. Well, right, we'll see. And yeah. how, I mean, I know it's just, just out, but how are sales, do you know, at this point of the book? Yeah, I've just been talking to nationwide book distributors who are who sales yet, sellers, and um, um, no, really good. Um, in fact, I'm having to make the tricky decision about reprints and stuff, because uh, there's worth calls have taken, so there's quite a lot of stock out there, and, you know, hopefully they're, they're, they're selling selling through, but... Um, you never quite know how much is there and everything's sold, sale or return these days. So if you reprint and then, you know, a whole lot of stuff comes back and unsold in, in 12 months' time, so you've got to be a bit careful. But no, really good, really good. I've, um, good. I topped the... We had a big launch in Auckland and I was number one on the... I don't know where I am this week, but I was number one on the um, Unity Books, the spin-off uh, sort of Unity Books uh, bestseller list. Oh, that's so wonderful. That was quite exciting. Unity's yeah. great, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Unity in Auckland and, and Wellington. Um, so I did another one with them there. So I, if, if hopefully uh, I can hit their bestseller list, which seems a bit of a scam because I can, uh, all, all I've really done is invited a whole lot of friends around and, and they've very kindly bought books. And uh, uh, yeah, anyway, so the sales look good. But yeah, beyond that, it's definitely selling. So it's mm. pretty exciting. I love, there's very robust language in your book, like I'm, I'm just, the, and, and it's been <laughs> littered through the interview, which I, which I quite enjoy. Do you, do you almost think that there, I mean, is, is this book for, it's not for the faint hearted really, is it? Well, that's a good point, yeah, and I was thinking, I better, you know, I'd be, be careful what I have to read in the, in the retirement home, but um, yeah, I don't know, it's, um, there are, there are certainly bits of Godfrey's character that uh, you know, sort of robust. I think, but he's not a really robust person himself. But he um, he's got very uh, strong opinions about things that uh, he he doesn't mind expressing. Even uh, certainly in his letter that he's writing to his or series of letters he's writing to his sister, he doesn't mind expressing them. But he he's probably not very brave about expressing them publicly. But um, yeah, I suppose someone said it's got quite a kind of Kiwi. Sort of humour in it, and um, quite earthy. And yeah, yeah, I think bits of it are, yeah. Mm, like I'm looking yeah, at it, at um, a, I'm just, I just flicked open just randomly. Okay, so I'm on page forty-five on the television. Yeah. I recognise some breasts again, but this time they were mothers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> Malcolm looked to be in some kind of stupor. I was surprised Mother was appearing naked on television and more surprised she was naked while helping a woman give birth on a table, which is just brilliant. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, that, and that really did... There was a... There there were births at centre point that were, um, you know, that where everyone gathered around and, and watched. Weird. And, they, and one of them was actually t- on TV in a documentary at the time. I think that's where this kind of came out of because... The bit that you were mentioning, the the boys are at boarding school watching um, Country Calendar, right? And the and the scene at the commune is actually on Country Calendar, which of course is completely ridiculous. I would never would never happen, but um, uh, yeah, so that's sort of a, sort of a combination of my memories of this of this documentary appearing, and um, I've got, I can't I have no idea if my mother was actually in the documentary naked, but it's certainly. There were plenty of naked people in the documentary, and then the and then had the birth. You know, the mother's giving birth, so it's kind of it was cert- certainly full. I mean, not a lot of my uh, boarding school friends sort of you know went to those sorts of do's right. <laughs> live birthing events. I mean, yeah, 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 it was quite very extreme. Peculiar. Yes, <laughs> I mean, yeah. obviously a natural <laughs> event, but. Uh, certainly, uh, having had a child, I don't think that's something I would uh, I would welcome uh, in the throes of childbirth. No, no, no. Well, my partner said no, it would, nothing can possibly be more appalling to him than the thought of that. But no, I mean, you know, I don't want to. You know, people. But, uh, I'm sure people who like that, yeah, had an amazing time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> so, so, um, so you shortly back to back to Blenheim. Yeah. Well, 
yeah. via, via yeah and and how is just uh, actually I haven't got much more time but um, is it is yeah. it um, is it wonderful living there I mean I, it conjures up a very romantic lifestyle to me with the vineyards and the you know the big open fields yeah no it's nice it's sort of um, a lot of what we loved about being here and the nature's not I mean it's absolutely gorgeous up there but nothing this is everything's on steroids here kind of the landscape and everything else isn't it but True. so but it's beautiful and it and it's kind of um it's much lower key and yeah we we actually do live in them we're surrounded by vineyard not not our vineyard but um uh we're yeah that's uh, and we're about like half a kilometre from the Wairo river and mm. it's that's amazing swimming and you can get up in the mountains and ski and hike and stuff it's all you mm. know all very accessible. You've got the Marlborough Sounds. It's, it's really lovely. So Gorgeous and stuff. Yeah, no, no. Mm. Yeah, no, yeah. We, no, we really like it. It suits us and both. We've only got one child still at home now, but um, they've really been an amazing part of their life growing up there. So. I'll be it. No, beautiful. One, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, actually, Luke, let's um, well, let's uh, let's wind this up. I think it's been absolutely brilliant talking with you about the last letter of Godfrey Cheatham, and I love uh, the picture your nephew uh, produced on the front cover. It's evocative. Uh, well done, and congratulations on oh. this book. I'm, uh, I've only a little way through, I have to confess, but I'm looking forward to uh, devouring it. So all the best with sales, and let's catch up soon. Thank you very much, Leanne. Real pleasure. Love, love talking to you. It's Thank been you. amazing. Thanks so much. Luke Elworthy. Okay.